Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. It's great to be with you. I've been looking forward to this for some time now. And, well, before you know it, it seems like it's over. But not yet. we got one more lesson. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 9. We're going to begin our study there in just a moment. Matthew chapter 9. I'm so grateful for the way God has blessed you as a church. Michael and his wife and Alfred and his family. With the elders that you have. A leadership team that certainly will help this congregation move forward. And though you have a great history and a tremendous reason to celebrate for where you are right now. With this kind of leadership, a willing, loving body of people that you are, the best days and the greatest days of this church are still in the future as you continue to spread God's word and be what God asked you to be in this community. I'd like to uh, start by encouraging people to remember who you are. And from scripture, we're described this way. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. And when you let others see your love for Christ, to see it living out in your life, they see your good works, they give glory to your Father who's in heaven. There are other places that you are described by the Apostle Paul in the Corinthian letter, Second Corinthian letter. He said, you are the aroma of Christ. That everywhere you go, you spread the fragrance of the knowledge of Him everywhere. Now some people will be attracted to the likeness of the aroma that you leave of Christ. It has to come from your heart, and that's what we're going to study this morning. Being the aroma of Christ comes because of your heart being like His. Other places in Scripture say, here's who you are. You're God's priests. You're a holy priesthood of believers. You're God's people. That you may declare the wonderful deeds of him who's called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's who you are. And while we're on the subject of being priests in his temple, we also realize that we are his temple. His spirit lives in us. By his spirit we are empowered. We have been given the direction he leads us into the work that he's given us to do. It's God's spirit that opens hearts and doors for us. But our heart needs to be right. With the spirit of Christ in us, it's Christ in you. It's the hope of glory, Paul said. That's who you are. You are the hope of God being glorified by people in this community. But they like, they must see you like a lampstand giving light to this community. He said, you're not only priests and temples, but you are members. You are members of his body. That's not like being a member of a club like we discussed in our class this morning. It's being a member of, the, of a body like my arm is a member of my body. It's a working, functioning, contributing part to the well-being of the entire body. And so you are as individual members. Contributing parts of a, of a body of people, a living organism that takes the gospel of Jesus Christ to this community. He says you're ambassadors for Christ. God's making his appeal to lost people through you. That's who you are. Ambassadors don't become citizens of the nation that they're sent to. They're citizens of their homeland, but they're there in that foreign land representing their homeland. Their citizenship is in another country than the one that they live in. And so we're here on planet Earth, but our citizenship, Paul told the Philippians, our citizenship is in heaven. That's who you are. You're members of God's family. You're citizens of his, of his kingdom. You are soldiers in his army. You're marching together to accomplish his purpose. It's of the king. It's by the king. It's for the king that you live because you are citizens in his kingdom and ambassadors for him on planet earth. It's also important to be reminded that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. 
you as a body of believers and you as individual members of it, you are able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you could ask or imagine by the Spirit of God, by the power of God that lives in you. We are his mouthpiece. We're here to tell good news until he comes to take us home. That's who you are. Let's pray. Father, we're about to open your word and study, and we ask you to bless us with understanding as you intended it when you inspired it in the proper application to our daily lives, Father, that we can go out this week and live out these <laughs> truths. That others would know you and turn their life over to the Lordship of your Son and march with us homeward with you in heaven forever. Bless us in our study. In Jesus we pray. Amen. In Matthew chapter 9, open there to verse 35. I'd like it if you would to follow along and look at what we're going to read. What we're going to look for here in this particular verse is, uh, this particular passage, is a description of the heart of Jesus. It has to be the same as the heart of this church. This church has a heart, this church has a personality, just like a person does. And it's made up of the, of the personalities and where the heart is of each individual member. Look at the heart of Jesus. This, this lesson this morning is a heart prepared for evangelism. Let's look at what he says here. Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the good news, the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every infirmity. And when he saw the crowds, here it comes, a one-word description of the heart of our Lord. When he saw lost people, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them. Because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. <coughs> you see, I've never raised a sheep. Some of you might have, but I understand from those that do, a sheep without a shepherd have no hope. And so people in this community, your friends and neighbors, your co-workers and fellow students, people that you have recreation with, people that are even members of your own family, if they do not know Jesus and have no, they have no hope because they don't know the shepherd. He's the only way home. When Jesus saw the condition, the spiritually lost condition of the people that he was looking at, he had compassion for them. That's where evangelism, our efforts to tell others, has to start with our hearts being filled with compassion for lost people. Sometimes we get so disgusted with sin, we end up disgusted with the sinner. But God, when he looks at lost people, he loves them. He hates sin, but he loves the sinner. And we have to have hearts that are filled with love for lost people and care. Not only know that they're lost, care that they're lost. And desire to help them find the shepherd. Notice where he says our process in doing this has to start. It has to start with the right kind of heart. But then, he says, as he turns to the disciples, verse 37, he turns to the disciples and he says, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray. Pray, therefore, the Lord of harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. When our hearts are right, brothers and sisters in Christ, the place that we have to start is in our evangelistic effort is to pray. I always have what I call my 10 most wanted list. You can put as many on there as you want, but pray for them by name every day. Make a list of people that you know that by their characteristics, by their attitude, by their language, by the way they approach life, their worldview, you can tell that they don't know Jesus. I'm not asking you to judge them. I'm just asking you to be a fruit inspector. Look at the fruit of their life and put their name on your list and begin to pray for them every single day. By name. Asking God that through His Spirit He would work on their hearts and He would soften them, prepare the soil because you have a seed that you want to plant, the gospel seed, the good news message of Jesus. With hearts filled with compassion for them. 
Pray for them every day. And then ask God to open the eyes of your hearts to see the opportunities that he will open up for you to begin to have a conversation with them and lead from a conversation into a Bible study and through the power of God's Holy Spirit authored word. His word, the gospel of Jesus Christ, will bring them to conversion. And they too will be brought out of darkness into his light, just as you have been. The first thing with the heart that's right for evangelism, turn to 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul reminds this particular church in such a clear way. He reminds each and each of the letters that the apostles wrote, there's clarity, but I don't know if it's ever any clearer than what he makes it here about the condition of lost people. Everybody in this room, everybody in this town, in this state, in this nation, everybody in this world that's on the planet Earth right now exists in one of two relationships with a holy God that loves them. It's either a relationship that is broken because of sin, separating you from God. Everybody here, think about it as you examine your own heart. Your relationship with God is either broken because of sin. It grieves Him. It should grieve you. Broken because of sin or reconciled because of obedient faith in Christ Jesus. What's your relationship with God today? As we look at each person in our life, everybody we come in contact with, they have, either have a broken relationship with God or a reconciled relationship because of Jesus. This particular passage reminds the Thessalonians, he's coming back, chapter 1, verse 7. He's coming back in flaming fire, he says. In verse 8, he said, he will be inflicting vengeance upon those who do not know God. And upon those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They, that's those that have not obeyed the gospel, that do not know God. They shall suffer the punishment of eternal destruction and exclusion from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. When he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at in all who have believed. This morning... Look at your own heart. <coughs> Ask yourself, have you obeyed the gospel? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Have you surrendered your life to Him, been buried with Him in baptism? If you have, then care about lost people because they are still lost like sheep without a shepherd. And once you have the gift of eternal life, the blessing of God's promise that you'll be with Him forever, Care about those that are lost. And take action. Pray for them. And begin conversations that will lead to conversion. Let's go clear back to the 51st Psalm. As David talks about his broken heart. A need for a brand new heart. Psalm 51. It might be that this morning you need a new heart. Maybe you need your heart changed about how you feel about lost people. Maybe you being lost, you need to change your heart and desire to have a right relationship with God. That's what David desired. He realized that even though he was a man after God's own heart, he had committed sin with Bathsheba. He had willingly disobeyed God's will, God's command. He was... Guilty, filled with shame and guilt, and knew that the consequence of his sin was a broken relationship with God. And so in Psalm 51, look what he prays for. Psalm 51, verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God. You see, he knew the problem was what he had done from his heart, and his heart needed to be changed. And so he said, create in me a clean heart, O God and put a new and right spirit within me. Well, brothers and sisters, let's stop and think about that for a minute. In 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21, as Peter is describing how the flood water saved Noah from sin, 
He says, and baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. It's an appeal to God for a clear conscience. It's not to go in and take a bath of our flesh, but to cleanse our hearts, to give us a clear conscience. So what David's asking for, he's already promised. This is what he does for you. He gives you a clear conscience. And in Acts chapter 2, where people said, what shall we do? Peter told him, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins clean record, sins forgiven, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. David's asking for a clean heart and a new spirit. And for those of you that have been baptized into Christ, that's what he's already done for you. He's given you a clear conscience, a clean heart, and a new spirit, his spirit to live in you. What else does David ask for? He says, cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Well, that he promised that to us. He promised that to you and me. He said, and lo, I am with you always. I will never leave you nor forsake you. So what David's asking for, God's already promised us. Clean heart, new spirit, his constant presence with us in our efforts to take the gospel to the lost. What else does he ask for? He says, restore to me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. David's asking that the joy of salvation would be returned to him. It was taken away because of the shame and the guilt that he felt. And he said, give me a clean heart, a new spirit, the constant awareness of your presence, and my joy will be restored. I'm a firm believer in the fact that Christians ought to be the happiest people on the planet. Amen? Amen. A little weak. A little <laughs> People ought to be able to see the joy of our salvation. Why? Because we know the end of the story. We're going home to be with us forever. There's not anything this world can do to take our joy away because this world is not the source of our joy. Our relationship with God, His promises, a home forever in heaven. That's what ought to make us the happiest people alive on this planet. Let's try it again. Amen? Amen. Ooh, that was good. That was good. I remember one particular weekend, I booked a wedding for the same weekend as the Crosstown Rivalry football game between the two high schools in town. Well, the high school game was on Friday night, but so was the wedding rehearsal. And I had to be at the wedding rehearsal. I wanted to be at the game. By the time the rehearsal is over and then the rehearsal dinner, I'm driving home. I know the game's got to be just about over. I'm going to go right past the field. There's still some folks in the stands. The game's still going on. I can't see the scoreboard. But you know, I took about a two-second glimpse of the stands. I knew which was the home side. I knew which was the visiting side. That quickly, I could tell who was winning that game at the end. There was one group that was standing up. You couldn't make them sit down. I mean, they were so excited. The other side, the few that were left, <laughs> they looked pitiful. When I got home and watched the local sports report, it only confirmed what I already knew. What glimpse could tell me? Those people filled with joy are the victors. Brothers and sisters in Christ, so are we. We're marching in triumphal procession, Paul reminded the Corinthian church. We know the end of the story. The battle, the victory has already been won. We're going home. David's asking for a clean heart, a new spirit. He's asking for a constant awareness of God's presence and restored joy. And we already have it. Look what David says next he will do when he has what we have. <clears throat> then, when? When I have a clean heart, a new spirit, and restored joy, then I will teach transgressors thy ways. And sinners will return to thee. He said, when I have... What the members of the church in Waynesboro, Virginia have. When I have what they have, 
I'll tell everybody. He says at the end of verse 14, My mouth shall sing aloud of thy deliverance. In verse 15, he said, O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. Basically what he's saying is, when he has what you have, he won't be able to keep quiet about it. Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah is called by God to be a spokesman, a prophet. A prophet was given a message from God miraculously to tell to the people of God. Sounds like you and me, doesn't it? He's given us a message to tell to everybody. In order for Isaiah to be able to fulfill, to fulfill, easy for you to say, in order for Isaiah to fulfill God's mission, God gave him a glimpse right into heaven itself. He could see into the throne room. And as he looked into the throne room of God, he saw the Holy One sitting on the throne and these angelic beings I said that in Texas one time. I thought I said jelly beans. <laughs> angelic beings, okay? These seraphims, these, these, uh, these ange angelic beings, they're flying back and forth over the, over the throne, and they're shouting, and they're singing to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with His glory. I got to thinking. They've been in His presence since creation. And they can't get over it. And when we get there one day, they're still going to be singing and shouting about it. And we're going to join in that anthem. And we're going to be singing and praising the holiness of our God. And then Isaiah, seeing how holy he is, recognizes he's not. In verse 5, he says, Woe, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. In other words, he said, I don't belong in his presence. I don't even belong to... I shouldn't even be able to look into here. I'm a man of unclean lips. I was born in the midst of a people of unclean lips. My eyes have seen his glory. And then the Lord did this most awesome thing. He said one of those angelic beings down to the altar to take a burning coal from the altar and come and touch Isaiah as an act of purifying him and making him holy. Michael, that looks like, that makes baptism look like a piece of cake, doesn't it? Burning coal on your lips. But that's what he did for you. When you Surrender your life to the Lordship of Jesus and we're buried with Christ in the waters of baptism. The blood of Jesus washes your sins away. He gives you His Spirit because now you are a holy place. And when He does this for Isaiah, it changes everything. He hears the Holy One say, Who shall I send? Who will go for us? He said, Here am I. Send me. Shouldn't that be the same measure of spontaneity with which we say, I can't keep it quiet. If the Lord has somebody that's ready to hear and he's looking for somebody to send, I'll go. When our hearts are right, we can't keep it to ourselves. Jeremiah. What do you say about Jeremiah? He said as a prophet to tell bad news. Aren't you glad he gave us good news? Somebody asked me, what do you do? I said, I tell people good news every day. Wow, what a way to live, huh? But that's all of our role. That's not just the preacher's role. That's everybody's role. Tell everybody good news every day. Jeremiah had bad news to tell. He was sent to the people of Israel to tell them because of your own willful disobedience. Sin. 
God is raising up a nation mightier than you, and you will be taken captive, taken away from your promised land. And when they heard it, when the people of Israel heard it, they laughed at him and they mocked him. And so Jeremiah said, Jeremiah chapter 19, no, Jeremiah 20. Because they mocked me, I want to say, I won't mention him or speak anymore in his name. I want to keep my mouth shut. He said, that's impossible for me. Look at verse 9. If I say, if I mention, I will not mention him or, or speak any more in his name. He says, there is in my heart, as it were, a burning fire. It's shut up in my bones and I'm weary with holding it in and I cannot. <coughs> Brothers and sisters of Christ, if our heart is right, if our heart is like Jesus, and we look at lost people and we have compassion, we have to say something. We can't keep quiet. Because there's like a fire that's burning. I call it holy heart burn. It's, it's like a fire that's burning in us. It's kind of like, it's kind of like grandparents, you know. You can't even get on the subject of their grandchildren because they're reaching for their wallet and they're going to show you the picture. What? Well, why do grandparents do that? I was listening to one speaker one time, and he was a grandparent. He said he was walking down the street one day with his grandchildren, one on each arm. And one of his friends came up and said, are those your grandchildren? And he says, yeah, you want to see their pictures? <laughs> <laughs> it's just natural for us to want to tell about why, because grandchildren bring joy and, and, and meaning and purpose to our life, and, and so we want to talk about it. We're, we're excited about it. We're proud of them. Shouldn't we be that way about our Lord? In our relationship with Him, we have passion. Brothers and sisters in Christ, members of the church, the body of Christ, what's happened to our passion? How can we keep it to ourselves? Lord, stir within us compassion for the lost. Passion within us that burns like a fire. It might be impossible for us to keep our mouth shut. Just as it was with Jeremiah. It's good news. We can't keep it to ourselves. We're going to sing a song. The song is only a step. There's a road called sin that leads to hell. And the world is following Satan right down that road. If you look ahead and you see that eternal home and know that you don't want to go there, it only takes a step, a commitment on your part, but a step, to step off from that road and onto a different road. Sorry for sin and turn from sin. That's the literal meaning of the word repentance. Sorry I've ever walked this road. I want to turn from this road. And it just takes one step. It's a step into the kingdom of God through the blood of Jesus Christ. It's a step out of darkness into his light. It's a step out of a lost relationship with God into a saved relationship with God. And the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus Christ that he shed at the cross is the only way to have your sins forgiven and to step off from that road that leads to hell and step onto the road that leads to heaven is only through the cross, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And this morning we're going to sing because there might be someone in this room that says, I want to take that step this morning into the watery grave of baptism to be buried with him, to be raised with him and start my journey on a new road in newness of life. It might be that you look at your heart this morning and you say, you know what, I did that, but my heart's not like Jesus. I haven't cared for lost people like I need to. 
maybe with a heart checkup this morning, you want to take a step and ask your brothers and sisters in Christ to pray for you. And they will. And recommit yourself to be a messenger, a disciple maker, on your way home, but not alone. <clears throat> Taking everybody and anybody that God will change their hearts by telling them the truth about Jesus. Let's stand and sing this song, Only a Step. And if you need to take that step this morning, just step out of the aisle. Come on up here. And we'll try to meet you.